genetics is the ultimate big data science. And so you need very large data pools, but you also need very large and high quality data pools. And what needs to be in this data, one is the genotypic information, and you can you get that by sequencing larger and larger numbers of people. Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker, and this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have on the show Jamie Metzel. Jamie Metzel is a technology futurist, geopolitical expert, novelist, entrepreneur, media commentator, and senior fellow of the Atlantic Council. In February 2019, he was appointed to the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Committee on developing global standards for the governance and oversight of human genome editing. Jamie previously served in the U.S. National Security Council, State Department, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and as a human rights officer for the United Nations in Cambodia. His latest book is called Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. Ray Kurzweil calls the book an outstanding guide to the most important conversations of our time, how we humans will hijack our evolutionary process and transcend the limits of our own biology. It's my great pleasure to have Jamie with us today. So welcome, Jamie. Thank you, James. Thrilled to be here. So share with everyone what's happening in your world just now. Well, there's a lot. As, as you mentioned, I have my big book coming out. April 23rd is the release date called Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. And it's really the story of the genetics revolution and more importantly, what it means for each of us because we are entering this genetic revolution that is going to fundamentally transform not just our health care, although it will, but the way we make babies, the nature of the babies we make, and ultimately our evolutionary trajectory of, as a species. And so that feels like far off sci-fi, but it's happening much, much sooner than, than people appreciate. And it's going to touch everyone in a far deeper and more profound way. And so I've written a book that if you could, as Sanjay Gupta said, if you can read one book um, about where our, our species is going, I hope that this is, this is it. And I'm really hoping to, to spark what I'm calling a species-wide inclusive species-wide dialogue on the future of human genetic engineering. And before we go into in-depth in some of the key messages in the book, I'm interested because this isn't your first rodeo. This isn't your first book. You have also written fiction books as well. Looking through your biography as well, you are definitely a, a Renaissance man. You have all these very interesting parts of what you do. And a question I usually ask of my guests here is how did you first learn your craft? And that's an interesting question to ask someone like you because I wonder... Do you even think about, do you, would you say you have a, a core craft to what you do, that everything revolves around? If you to strip everything else away, it comes back to this one craft that you have. Yeah, yeah. So a few points. First, I mean, a lot of people um, call me a Renaissance man. And what I, I tell everybody who says that is you're really in the Renaissance. About 98% of everybody was shoveling manure or doing something equivalent to that. So it's not being around in the Renaissance. It's what role did you play in the, in the, uh, in the Renaissance? And connected to that, when I kind of strip everything away, and I certainly I, I love to write and I love to, uh, to communicate, but I'd say my, my core skill in this world is to take, is one, being a voracious learner, but two, and essentially to take all of this data and all of this information from so many different sources and weave it together into a story that is meaningful and actionable for uh, for people because that's it's really difficult we all myself included we live in these little bubbles and by definition um, and so it's really hard to kind of see these bigger forces that are transforming our lives what I what I pride myself on whether I'm good at it or not you know other people that I can judge is to, to understand these, these stories about what's coming maybe a little better than, than, than some other people <clears throat> and to translate that insight into, into forms 
that other people can can absorb. And so these these they were these ways that the future is going to change become a little less scary and people start to see themselves in that future and then feel empowered to play a, a role in shaping that future, both for themselves and for the communities around them. So I'd imagine a book like this obviously requires, you see, you're a voracious learner. It requires huge amounts of research in different fields, not just in, in uh, genetic biology, but in, in other kind of related fields and some unrelated fields. How do you go about, first of all, as you're going through these um, kind of cataloging what you want, what you see as important, you know, highlighting certain things? How do you then go about kind of synthesizing this information? Because it'd be quite easy just to go and you're taking all this information in and, and create, write something which reads like a a textbook, an academic textbook where you're you're ending up a bit like a like a cover band in music you rather than being an original artist. How, how do you go from synthesizing to actually finding those messages those stories that are unique to you and only you perhaps can tell so first people ask me about research all the time and I, what i always tell people is well i don't do any research and they say what how do you write about all these technical subjects without doing research and what i mean is not that i don't do research this is when i'm doing research it's not like i'm feeling like oh now it's it's four o'clock it's time for research like my entire life is and always has been dedicated just to learning everything that i possibly can and then at a certain point, I get to the thing where I say, I feel like, you know, I, wow, I really have something to say. And so certainly with this book, this is a topic um, that I've been writing and, and speaking about for over 20 years. Um, and um, so I, I definitely, over the years, of just thinking so much about so many aspects of the, the genetic future and the, of our species and how genetic engineering is going to change us and, and, and the world around us. You know, I've, I've come to these, these preliminary hypotheses and conclusions and you know, in giving so many talks all around the world that I've had to challenge myself. I, I speak to scientists and doctors and middle schoolers and everybody's kind of poking and prodding and adding and asking questions, which has forced me to really over the many years find my voice. And so with this book, um, what I, I have my my kind of big case that I've been making for for many many years about why the genetic um, revolution is coming and and what it means and what we need to do. And so then I started this book with that outline, um, and then there were areas where I felt like you know I'm I'm really strong, and then there were some kind of adjacent areas where I needed to write about it, and I felt like, well, I mean, I need to deepen myself in those areas. So I just, I made a list of those things and, um, and learned them to the best of my uh, abilities. But the core thing um, for this is not, is when you're writing a story to not get lost in, in tangents. And it really helps me um, that I'm also a novelist because in, in, in a novel, in a good novel, and I guess you could write Ulysses, but, um, which is also a good novel, but, but for a kind of a, science fiction novel, the kind of things that I've written, you really, you can't lose your narrative. You can't lose the essence of where you're going or your reader will, uh, will get lost. So for me, try, tackling a complex scientific topic with the sensibility of a novelist, I feel like it was a real, a real asset. So let's go into the, the actual kind of genetic engineering part itself and how, what some of these trends are that we're starting to see. I remember my, my wife's a lawyer. I remember coming back from work one day and saying, I've just been working on the intellectual property related to this thing. And it's really weird. It's, it's basically a sheep in Aberdeen that we've done uh, where they've taken it and they've gen genetically engineered. Starts with a D. Yeah, it's a dolly, do dolly the sheep. And I remember telling me, and I said, that, sound, that sounds kind of creepy. Now, when you see like things that are coming out of China in terms of, I know you've written about this, using CRISPR, uh, very powerful um, tools now to really change the genetic makeup of 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 sentient beings of living things um so how do you you kind of almost feel like at one end you've kind of got this transhumanism that we're going to evolve past the species and the other side you've got this very kind of dark um possibilities as well where do you find at the end of the book where did you find yourself coming out on are you positive about where we're going with genetic engineering yeah well, i'm certainly very positive but that doesn't mean that anything goes. And so one, I'm certainly you know, very critical of the people who say we just need to shut this down now because it's so dangerous because genetic te technologies 
are going to help us live longer, healthier, more robust lives. They're going to help us um, cure and, and eliminate you know, all kinds of terrible diseases that cause tremendous suffering. And they're going to help us you know, live lives in a hotter planet. You know, someday our Earth is going to go away and we're, if we're to survive, we're going to have to live in space, but we won't be able to do it with the biology uh, that we have. So this is, is really important stuff for our survival as a species. And if we're going to start, we should start now. Um, at the same time, though, there are the transhumanists who feel this should just be unregulated. Everyone should just do whatever they want. And, and I'm, I'm very strongly against that as well. I mean, what we're talking about is the future of all of life and, and our lives. Um, and this is very powerful technology and, and therefore it should and it, and it must be regulated and it needs to be regulated in a smart and thoughtful way. We can't have regulatory black holes. We need to have an inclusive process to build the norms and, and that underpin these kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, of regulations. So I'm certainly all in all net positive. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm not aware of the dangers as well. Interesting. Just now, you know, we're seeing obviously with some of the social media companies, we're having to, you know, many regulators have to kind of catch up to how things have evolved and not really have having this thing. But it seems to be on on this topic and also kind of related things in terms of artificial intelligence. There is definitely a feel amongst the the creators of some of these technologies. We need to start looking at ethics, how these things relate, you know, um, what regulation needs to happen. But something I've seen you write a lot about because you have this experience, you know, with State Department and other things of, of, of having a very global outlook. You've spoken in the past about these two ecosystems are starting to change and almost like being separate. The, the, the China technology ecosystem versus the, the U.S. or like the Western based one as well. How, how are they each of these two very different systems? How are they approaching genetic engineering and, and this future of humanity? Yeah, so there's there's some similarity and overlap between these two ecosystems, and there are significant differences. And in, in broader terms, this U.S. innovation, U.S.-centered innovation and, and creativity ecosystem is evolving in one way, and then the greater China ecosystem is evolving in another way. Uh, there's a lot of overlap now, but in many areas, that level of overlap is decreasing. And so I think that in 10 years, there's a, a significant likelihood there'll be kind of a, a U.S.-centered Internet and a China-centered Internet. And um, there'll be different rules of the road. Uh, and certainly in terms of the norms that are used around big science and revolutionary science, we're, our two cultures are, are in many ways coming at this with very different backgrounds. And on genetics, uh, the Judeo-Christian societies tend to believe um, that in, in this idea, even the, the secular atheist among us, that, um, that the world um, exists based on some kind of divine inspiration. And even the people who are the atheists in the West, like the anti-GMO campaigners, just have this gut feeling that messing with nature is wrong. Uh, but in China, and this is a gross uh, but not entirely wrong overgeneralization, um, there's a sense that engineering is what humans do. And so there's a much greater level of comfort with, uh, with societal engineering. And the, the one-child policy in China is an example of that. Um, and there's a much higher, greater level of comfort, even on a parental level, with making these kinds of, of tough decisions in the context of um, assisted reproduction, in vitro fertilization, and in the not distant future about embryo selection and ultimately uh, genetic alteration of, uh, of embryos. And so uh, culture, the technology is racing forward, but our cultures are different. And then the, those cultural difference, differences are exacerbated um, by the competitive environment within environments uh, within and between societies. And so all of that, that's why I think you can kind of, you can't just see the science in and of itself. The science exists within these broader um, societal contexts, uh, both within countries and, and internationally that in many ways shape how the science evolves. So for something like, uh, um, I know China has this plan, the 2025 plan, you know, very strong on AI, being number one on AI. The U.S. has only just, I think, brought out an AI strategy um, behind a lot of other other countries. Well, the U.S. had one under Obama, 
And then uh, President Trump took office and gutted the Office of Science and Technology Policy, didn't mention AI, uh, didn't mention science. Now there seems to be a, rec- a greater recognition in the Trump administration about what's at stake, but the U.S. has certainly lost a lot over these last uh, couple of years. So one of the things that it feels like China has the edge on is data, being Correct. free-flowing of data in, in a, a very different way than we would certainly have in Europe or you would probably have it in the U.S. as well. So it feels like that's a bit an advantage. AI just needs data. That's that's how it functions. So and when it comes to yes. genetic engineering, what do you see... Is 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 data like one of those secret things you or most important things you need, or is there something else that you think that one of those ecosystems they're gonna they have a better chance because they they're more in they they have better access to this particular resource or this particular way of doing things. Well, certainly one is a quality culture of responsible science, and so uh, the U.S is significantly, and Europe are significantly ahead of China in that area, but China is catching up. Um, Genetics is the ultimate big data science. And so you need very large data pools, but you also need very large and high quality data pools. And what needs to be in this data, one is the genotypic information, and you you get that by sequencing larger and larger numbers of people. And so China... Um, will almost certainly outpace uh, the United States and the West in sequencing uh, its uh, its citizens. Um, but then you also need extremely high quality, not just electronic health records, but electronic life records. Uh, because if you have messy, um, messy systems or systems um, that aren't aligned with each other or a mishmash of, of different systems. It makes it very, very difficult um, to access these big data pools that are so essential for for finding these deep insights that will that will drive genetic technologies forward. And so China, because of its central organization, has an opportunity to move ahead. Mm-hmm. And there are countries in the West, like the United Kingdom, actually, because of the centralization of healthcare around the the national health service, actually the UK has an advantage. With the United States, there are certainly models for uh, distributed data networks, and there are different companies that are using blockchain and other and other models to try to build these. Um, but this is a race, and whoever, whichever society builds the better, high quality, more inclusive data pools, they are certainly going to have an advantage because the algorithms are really important, but they are more easily shareable than the data pool. So as we start moving towards this, you, you way of thinking about genetics and the, the engineering of our uh, genetics as well. Obviously, there's the, the stuff that gets uh, talked about a lot. I know this, I saw one thing you wrote, like how uh, is sex for reproduction about to become extinct? So that's kind of really kind of an interesting thing but was is anything else that you've seen as you were doing your research and writing this book that 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 you just you know frankly just knocked you on the back of your heels and you went oh okay (laughs) this is you know the the, the real turned your head well the thing is i mean i i I live in this world so there's very few things that really blow my mind but the thing there's a few things that constantly just i mean shock me and that is Every time when I think about some time frame, because I'm also a science fiction writer, and when you're writing science fiction, you know, you can just kind of, you don't really need to be absolutely exact about when something happens. I mean, if you're trying to be realistic, you say, I think this is going to happen, and I've written it in the future, and if it's going to happen in 2045 or 2075 or some other time, it's like no one's, no one's going to kill you for that. Um, but I'm always surprised that all of these things that, that I, and I'm certainly not the only one, but have predicted will happen, all seem to happen so much faster than you would think, than I, certainly I would have, um, would have thought. Like just with this book, with Hacking Darwin, um, it was when I, I, you know that there's, there's this process and when you submit the book and then you finalize the book and then you, you lose control because it's gone into production. And I had to fight it back two times. The first time was it had already gone into production. And then um, 
these two female mice in a lab had their own 100% biologically related baby, which is something I'd written about this in the book, that single sex couples were going to be able to have their own 100% biologically related children. But it was like an abstract thing based on my interpretation of the science. But then it actually happened. And I thought, well, I can't write about this. And it happened and not mention it. So then I, I, I have the most wonderful publisher in the world, Sourcebooks, um, who I love. But that's a subject for another, another time. Um, and I had to kind of fight it back, and I got it. And then I submitted it. And then there was the announcement in November 2018 um, at, uh, by um, uh, Dr. He um, that these genetically engineered babies had been born. I thought, well, geez, you can't have a book on, on hacking the human and not mention that it actually happened. And so I'd always said, and the whole book was about this is going to happen, but I would have thought it wouldn't have been in 2018. I would have thought it would, would have been in 2020 or 2021. I'm guessing this book is going to have many editions over the year <laughs> if you want to do it that way. Absolutely. And so I have this thing because every day, you know, I read so much and every day something will, will, will you know, I'll see and I'll say, well, this is really important. So, you know, I have a certain word and um, I won't tell you what it is um, because you're, this isn't that kind of show, um, but it's like a swear word. Um, and then I forward whatever uh, news story or, or scientific study I have to myself with this word in the title. And so then I know that when it's for the next thing, I'm going to say, with this, <laughs> you know, I, I just have to do a search in my email for this one word, which guaranteed will not be used in any other context. And then I'll have these hundreds of reports that I'm collecting. So, so definitely for uh, the next editions and for the paperback, and this is the kind of thing where I, where I will certainly will be, will be, revising and updating well the thing is you're in good company your book is is obviously it has the, the darwin uh side there as well and and i, I was recently at the, one of the libraries in london they have the edition yeah. of uh yeah. the origin of species charles darwin's the origin of species and one of the things i never realized in the book it was the only the eighth edition where he mentions evolution mm. evolutionary for the first time the first seven uh editions of that book never mentioned evolution evolutionary so it took the eighth edition so these things are always it doesn't matter who you are they're, they're always growing as you've been going along your own creative journey you've had a really fascinating life and of, of writing and research and obviously speaking i know you're very into the very healthy kind of lifestyle as well was it a key time in your life where you frankly gave something your all perhaps but it didn't work out like you'd hoped and uh, what was the lesson that you took from that experience so um in 2004 I ran for United States Congress from my, in my hometown, original hometown of Kansas City. And I felt it was my mission in life because the same skill set that I've described to you about taking all of these, um, these changes in the world and information and turning them into a story and then using that story to try to inspire people to do, take a certain action that you believe will make the world a better place. That, you know, that's part of writing, but that's, you know, politics at its best is about that. And so I really threw my all into that, uh, into that process. And I, I didn't win. Um, upon analysis, the reason why I didn't win was because the other guy got more votes. Um, that's a joke. I don't hear laughter. But this, okay, good. Uh, okay. <laughs> Damn. You know, if, you, if, you, if, if you'd stood in China, you might have had a chance there, but never mind. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But afterwards... I and I had just been on. I was just like, you know, like a just fully on for more than a year, and then afterwards, I like I kind of crashed, and and I just like emotionally and physically, I just felt exhausted. But I had this kind of heroic sense of myself. It's like, well, I'm not a person person who crashes. I can you know, go from one peak to the next peak. And, you know, if it's not this, you know, where's the next dragon? And so I just, I really didn't give myself the space just to accept that my body was telling me something that you just can't be fully on always for your whole life. And the fighting against it actually was har was harmful to me. And it kind of, it gave me, even though I, I don't write about humble things, it just gave me a sense of 
humility that that we are that, that we are beings have these rhythms and willpower I mean, I'm all about willpower and, and discipline but we also just kind of have to respect ourselves as we are in the world as it is and kind of figure out what's the right balance between accepting accepting that kind of harmony but also never just saying well the world is exactly as it is and I'm a passive player without the ability to do my bit to try to make it better. And I know today you're often on stages, traveling around the world, speaking. I'm guessing this there's going to be a big uh, speaking tour on the back of this book as well. Yeah, 15 cities. Um, and it's kind of, of grueling. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a musician. And I say, you know, it's this. It's like you know, I'm giving a big talk one night and then wake up at four in the morning and fly to the next place. And then I'm you know, speaking at noon in a city that's a three hour flight away. And it's like, it sounds, that sounds like a musician. And so I, I will have this kind of somewhat grueling um, 15 city uh, book tour. But, you know, when you write books, that's the exciting. You're sitting down with a, with a blank page or a blank screen. That's terror. Having a book that you're traveling around talking about where people, you know, sing your praises, that's actually pleasure wonderful and talking about screens um as we start to finish up here just a couple of quick fire questions for you do you have an online resource or a tool or a mobile app like evernote that, that you love and that helps you do the, the work you do you know not really i mean i, I use my iphone like yeah you know, like everybody else i mean it's going to be no um, insight to everybody that i use microsoft word um so I don't, I don't i feel like on that i may have i hope i have some insights about life in times of uh, technology, I'm going to listen to all of your other people you've interviewed because I guarantee you they will know more than I do about that. You were mentioning music there, being, being a, the, the, the life of a speaker is actually very similar to the life of a touring musician. If you could recommend just one album and also one book to our listeners, not your own book, a book by another author, what would that record in that book be? So when you use the word record, it forces me to look historically at myself when actually I had records because now i don't know anybody who has records it's so retro and i love that term so if the answer is record i will have to tell you the record that i listened to over and over and over and it will not surprise anybody to hear that that record is thriller so if anybody hasn't heard of it it's like this new this record by michael jackson i know we're not supposed to mention michael jackson these days but that's for the answer of record for the books Thank you for mentioning my book, but I just finished a book that just moved me so deeply. And I, it, I really, I'm, I've sent copies to many people who I know, and I certainly am I'm telling everyone, certainly anybody living in, um, in the Americas about this book. It's called The Earth Shall Weep by James Wilson. It's about really the terrible tragedy of what happened to the Native American Indians after the uh, the European settlers arrived in uh, in, in North America, North and South America, and it's just it's it's a such a deeply moving book, um, and it's such a tragic history, and it's just terrible, and it's so um, not sufficiently in the consciousness of most people here in in the Americas. So it's it's certainly a great book, and I and I recommend it highly. Fantastic. We'll put all those links here. So if people just go to jamesdale.me, just look for Jamie Metzl's name and you'll see all these show notes here as well. Um, if, let's, final, as we start to finish up here, I want you to imagine tomorrow morning you woke up and you have to start from scratch. So you've got all the tools of your trade, all the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you. You know no one. You have to restart. What would you do? How would you restart? It's a great question. And I kind of feel that way every single morning in the sense that every single morning I wake up and think, all right, wife, well, done these things in the past, but that's already done. And so I've already kind of banked those. Where am I, uh, where am I going now? And then I would just continue to do the things that I do now. I would be, um, I would go out and I would talk to people and I would find topics that interest me. And I just would throw myself into learning everything that I could. And I, and whether that, once you have that kind of process and that kind of knowledge, then you can figure out what's the right application for it. Is the application writing? Is it speaking? Is it business? Is it medicine? There's so many different things. But I, like that kind of curiosity-driven 
life, where you're learning about something, developing theses, and acting upon those theses. In, in my mind, that's kind of the core of everything else. And where's the best place for people to go so they can learn more about you, this book, and also some of your other writing? As I would be really honored if people would do that. It's my website, www.jamiemetzl.com, and it's J-A-M-I-E-M-E-T-Z-L. Fantastic. Well, Jamie, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today, learning all about the new book, which is called Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. I wish you great success with the launch of the book and also with the the, the tour, your life on the road as you go around uh, sharing the ideas in the book with everyone. Thanks so much for telling us about your creative life. Wonderful. Thank you, James. Bye-bye. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.